Welcome everyone. Thank you for coming in. Dzień dobry wszystkim. Witam, witam i dziękuję za przybycie. Uh, I think I'm the first Polish speaker today. Okay. So how many people do we have from Poland in the audience? Okay, awesome. And uh, how many uh, UX designers? Okay, H how many UX researchers? All right. How many people who have to do user, uh, research for anything doing their work? Okay. All right, so, so this is, I think this is going to be fine. Um, so wh what I'm going to be talking uh, about today is how to keep UX real and how to empower and inspire with UX research. And uh, just a little bit about myself. Uh, so uh, I, uh, I'm, uh, I, I'm a social scientist. I, I got a PhD from the University of Utah, go Utes. And, and then I went in and uh, started working as a UX researcher. And uh, I'm originally from Poland, and now I live in the United States and try to visit Poland as often as I can. And I'm very happy to be here. And uh, I work for this company. I've been working uh, with them uh, for two years, uh, Closed Loop. Uh, we do various UX services for companies in Silicon Valley and uh, in the Bay Area. And we're located in Roseville, California, not too far away from Silicon Valley. So this, uh, this talk is based on uh, years of my experience trying to figure out how to make UX research more impactful and how to actually get people to act on research. And, but this is not only for UX researchers, this is also for, I know the designers have to do their own research and then convince others to sort of use this evidence to make impact within organization. So, so I have some strategies for you that I came up with, some tactics that can help you sort of get the message across and get people to act on this evidence and the results of the UX research. You know, when I first started as a UX researcher, I was, you know, it's, it's hard work, uh, and you put a lot of work into it, and I was just really happy at the beginning to just be like, okay, the project is done, you know, just I hand it over, here are the results, and you guys deal with it, and I can celebrate, right? Because uh, my, my job is done. And then after doing this for many, many years, I realized that this was not rewarding anymore. That really what, what's rewarding is to, when you take these results and you actually make a change and use them to, to improve things. And, and this is, doesn't always happen in, in organizations because you know, sometimes the things happen quickly and there are other things that uh, kind of prevent UX research to, from, from being used. So how can, we, how can we change it and how can we sort of use strategies to help make impact with, with UX research? Uh, I roughly uh, think about UX research as sort of having roughly three steps. So first is when uh, someone, is, uh, some, someone comes to you and says, hey, can you do this research for me? They request uh, um, a pr proposal for research, right? And then you, uh, the second step is when you go out, go out into the field and you conduct research, and then, uh, then you have to share the results. And you will, will hear a lot of strategies uh, for the last part, when you actually have the results and now how do I communicate them? How, how do I share the, this, uh, this information with, with designers, programmers, uh, content strategists, right? But I really believe that you can do things at every step in UX research process to make sure that the, the, these results are being used. So starting with uh, when you have to uh, when someone comes to you and says, hey, can you, can you do this research for me? What, what do I need to do as a UX researcher to make sure that then they will use the, the results that I produce, right? So really kind of not rocket science, uh, but you know, sometimes we kind of forget that it's really important to understand intentions and you know, 
I ask people, okay, what do you want to find out? Basic question, right? Uh, do you have hypotheses? Do you have assumptions? Uh, but in that question, what do you want to find out? You also want to kind of look for sort of hidden agendas and um, the type of answer you might get is, you know, we just want to uh, prove that our service and our product is great. So can you go out there and ask the users and, and tell us it's, it's great, right? Well, that's a red flag because uh, the, this person is not going to be open to negative information that you might provide in the report, right? Uh, so so you, you definitely don't want to take this, kind, this project. Uh, you know, it's, what's also important is that you, you want to plan, uh, you, you want to ask people to, have, to give you a plan for how this research is going to be used. So if they tell you, hey, we're going we're gonna to build a prototype from this uh, research, or we're going to have a list of principles and recommendations, and then we're going to go and, and make changes based on that. That's good, right? If you hear something like, oh, you know, just, just do the research and give me the report and we'll figure it out, we're just curious, that's probably not a good sign, and you want to sit down with this person and write a proposal for how they're going to use the results. They need to have an idea from the very beginning. And also you want to know what cannot be changed, because uh, re a recent example, we, we were uh, asked to evaluate a website that was newly designed, and we found out that the, the font was too small. So basic, right? And we, were, we spent a lot of time documenting, you know, your font is too small, the, the, the people who are using your websites are, are older, they can't read the font. And then uh, we found out that it can't be changed. We can't change the font. So, you know, that was a waste of time for everyone, right? So you want to make sure you find out at the beginning what cannot be changed, because you don't want to spend time uh, researching that. Uh, you know, another thing that, uh, as UX researchers, people do in research, we, f we forget is that you actually have to listen to stakeholders within the organization. And because we focus so much on users, right? We want to know what's, what the users think and how they behave, and, and we want to collect the, this information. But we forget to actually talk about these people within the organization who commissioned the research, who are experts, who have worked there for many, many years. They have opinions about what's working, what's not working, but we're like, oh, you know, whatever, we need to listen to the users. But you actually, re it's really important to, um, to hear them out because then they will hear you out. They will be more sort of committed to acting on, on the results that you bring in. So, you know, this can be pretty simple. You can just get people in one room and ask them, hey, what do you, what do you think? But if you have a large organization, you, you might want to do it in a more formal way. So this is... Um, my first uh, case study that I want to show you, and simply for, for getting people together within the organization, all the stakeholders, not users, just people who work for the organization where you have to make the impact, uh, you, you, you want to get them together in a formal way, and you can do um, what we call a story mapping workshop. So this, uh, this was done for, it was a two-day story mapping workshop for one of the world's largest online payment companies uh, where we had 45 people, designers, content strategists, um, product managers, and we, uh, we were coming up with a UX strategy for a major website redesign. And this website was actually not, was supposed to be released all over the world. It's a global organization, right? and research was a part of it. And so what we decided to do is make sure that everyone had a voice within the organization uh, and we, wanna hear, uh, we wanted to hear their opinions. So no users were involved in this. It was just people coming together within the organization and giving their opinions. And um, in, in the story mapping workshop, what you do is you basically discuss what the user journey looks like from the perspective of the company and the organization, and then you kind of create this uh, big document that you put up somewhere and people kind of can refer to it 
when they um, when they de design the product or service, develop it, and, and ma maintain it, right? But you know, so this is kind of what, what you discuss in the, in the user journey. You, you might want to discuss what the goals of the users are, what activities they need to do, what tasks more granular they need to do to, um, to sort of uh, use the service, and then you create stories. And based on those stories, you then create designs, right? And you know, this, this, it kind of looks like this. It's just a bunch of post-it notes. <laughs> You've seen it so many times. And you know what? This is not even important, this whole document. The, the, the whole purpose of this uh, story mapping work workshop is just to give people a chance to say what they think and uh, get them on board, because then they will be much more willing to collaborate with you. And if you're interested, uh, uh, if you wanted to do story mapping, you, you, I have some resources here for you. Uh, you can try it on your own. So next is uh, when, uh, what happens when you're in the field conducting research, what can, you can do to make sure that the, the research is being used. So what ends up happening is like when you, when you say um, in the organization, hey, we're doing research, everyone wants to go with you. Like, yeah, take me with you. I want to I wanna watch the users. I want to go and I want to observe. And uh, you, know, you, start, uh, you start interviewing the users. You have, you have all these people watching. And, and then after like two hours, everyone's on Facebook and checking their email and totally lost interest in, in user research. And you know what? That's not their fault. It's, it's, the, it's, the, it's my fault as a UX researcher because I need to make sure that I give them structure to, um, to actually participate actively in UX research. So what we do, uh, we, we give people tasks. Hey, you have to take notes. You have to uh, write down insights. And uh, one example here is in this picture, we put up a big grid on the wall with each participant, each user, uh, and sort of insights about them, right? And, and you kind of have to follow it throughout uh, your observations. And, uh, and the, the stakeholders, uh, the people watching, observing, they are the ones doing it. I have a couple other examples here. Uh, this is uh, for testing uh, a usability for a mobile app, and we actually printed out um, uh, all of the you know pages from the mobile app and put them up on the wall and asked people, asked designers who were observing the sessions to come in and you know mark on each page where they have to work, what they have to work on, where are some problems uh, that need to be. Um, redesigned. So you have to make sure you put them to work. And also another thing is you, you want to make sure you, you're not the type of researcher who goes out and disappears <laughs> from everyone and d does their own research and then comes back and here are the results. You want to be giving updates to people frequently. After every day after you have observations, interviews with the users, you want to make sure you send out an update maybe with some interesting findings. So here's one uh, from a recent project that I did. And basically at the end, of the, pro the end of the day, I just send an email and say, hey, we had seven people come in. Uh, people spent three minutes trying to create a new user account for your service and uh, a lot of them abandoned the website. So here you go, you can you know, do something about it right away when, when the research is still being done. And next is uh, when you have to share the results. So maybe is, it's when you write up a report or you, you share, the, share the information in, in various different ways. You know, uh, what I learned, again, here is, is not really rocket science. Uh, you have to deliver results very quickly. And what I mean by this is, you know, obviously in UX research, sometimes it takes you weeks or months to analyze, so you can't really produce a report in one or two days. But what I tend to do is, uh, after one or two days, I send out uh, basically, uh, really quick uh, email 
saying, you know, this is what we did, here are kind of the biggest trends, and, uh, you know, what I call low-hanging fruits, so e things that are easy to fix, and that you can start working on right away. And, and why is this important? It's because, uh, like we heard in the previous presentation, you know, there's a lot of pressure on designers to work fast, to produce results, and uh, as UX, uh, UX researchers, we have to keep up with that, you know? We can't just go out there and spend a month analyzing something, because designers, they need to get results fast and, and show impact quickly, right? So what's worked for me is uh, just uh, basically simple, sending out an email, summarizing results, and then I go back and work on my report and uh, create a report later. Uh, you know, another thing that I really like is, do you guys know Luke Wroblewski? Okay, cool. Uh, I really like this guy. He, uh, not because he's Polish, also because of that. He should be invited to this conference, by the way. Uh, you know, he is, um, he does UX research, UX design, and I follow him on LinkedIn, and every day he just sends one chunk of information uh, about one, one, re one piece of data and recommendations for that, right? And this is about the attention span people have these days. So, you know, you just read this one piece of information and you're like, oh, you're inspired. You, you can, you, you're not committed to reading, reading this long report. It's just one small chunk of information, right? And you can do something about it. So I think that's really cool. You know, another thing is uh, we, as humans, we, we love instant gratification. So we can actually, as researchers, use it to our advantage. And, you know, make sure that you uh, highlight things that are easy to fix. You know, because people are, get more encouraged. They're like, okay, I fixed this thing. I designed this small piece that's working better now. Now I can tackle these bigger challenges, right? And, uh, and that's kind of that encouragement that people need to move forward. And another thing that's really important is, you know, as UX researchers, we tend to, we, we're paid to actually bring bad news a lot of times. So, hey, this, this is not working. You need to change this. You know, uh, people hate this service that you designed. So we don't bring uh, good news a lot of times. And uh, we're, we're very focused on that, just, just highlight the negatives. But what's actually really important is to highlight positives, to highlight things that really work well. And hey, you just keep doing these things. You're doing great, right? People really like that uh, gratification because when you create results, a, a report that's just full of bad news, it's like you know commercials w about smoking and cancer. They're they're like so bad that you just ignore them. Like I can't do anything about it. It's it's too much bad stuff. It's just like I'm helpless, right? So you want to make sure you have positives too. You know, another thing is uh, I've seen today a lot uh, in our, all of our presentations, <laughs> pictures, you know, of actually people, uh, real, real people telling you real stories, right? And uh, we, that's what we tend to do when we, when we come out and create a talk and, and we like to, you know, highlight stories. But actually within your organization, with the people you work with, you should be using those stories every day to make impact. And you want to be putting pictures of the users, of the people you talk to. You want to be giving quotes. You want to be, uh, uh, you know, sort of show, showing user videos if you have that, uh, to to really highlight the stories. And you know, um, this uh, this is Eileen from one of the studies that I did, and she was telling me about, uh, we were just sitting and talking, and she's uh, uh, telling me about how she buys tickets to different events, and how she kind of keeps track of all the events she, her and her family need to, need to go. And she's like, yeah, and we do this, and then she's like, hey, I'll show you. So she, uh, so we were, we were on the phone, it was a remote session, so she comes up to this board, 
full of papers. And she's like, that's, that's how we keep track, right? I mean, it, it's, not, it's so hard to describe in words the, the kind of a mess that, that uh, sort of she has, and sometimes she, she keeps track, uh, somehow she keeps track of this information, right? It's much better to show it uh, in a picture. And, and again, like we talked uh, before in our previous presentations, you know, it, what it is for is to create empathy. So again, the example with, uh, would you design this for your mom, right? It's the same thing. When you, when you create empathy with those, the photos and the quotes, you, you will actually, the people will be sort of better advocates for users, right? So that's how you can do it. Um, another thing is you wanna make sure you um, cater to different learning styles. So as you all know, uh, people learn in different ways. Some people are visual, some people like to read. Um, and not only that, you know, some, some people really are detail-oriented and they like a lot of information. I know a lot of programmers who, who are that way. And, uh, and then some people are very playful and they just want to learn through playing and trying things out. So you want to make sure you deliver results to all these different learning styles and also time commitments because some people are a bit more busy they um, have less time to spend, uh, you know, reading your reports, right? So I have another case study here for how to, how to, how to present research results to different learning styles. This was for uh, one of the largest event ticket resellers in the United States. It's like an eBay for selling tickets. And uh, what they, they came to us and they asked us, hey, can you help us understand the end-to-end -end experience for people who buy tickets to different events um, for a specific occasion. So like, I want to take my girlf girlfriend out for a date and I'm gonna buy tickets, you know, that's an occasion, right? And we, uh, had, we invited many, many people for interviews and we, we had 11, actually 11,000 minutes of audio and video and we created for them multiple uh, user journey maps showing these different experiences, right? Every map ha had 100 data points. So uh, they were all, you know, pretty. You can kind of see the example. And you know, you know what? They came back to us and said, you know what? We have a lot of these maps and they have a lot of data in them. And how do we convince people to even look at the maps, read what's in them, right, and, and use this in information? And how do we empower people with these maps? So we, what we ended up doing is creating uh, several other deliverables for, um, based on those maps to cater to different learning styles. So we decided to do playing cards. And for people who are more playful and maybe don't have much time to, to spend reading the maps, right? You can uh, just keep them on, on your desk and flip through them and get inspired and you can use them in workshops. We actually uh, also d designed some games that you can play and, and these cards actually have results from research, right? And kind of a cool playful way. And for people who are really detail-oriented and like data, uh, geeky people, we, we also created a spreadsheet that had all of the maps in the spreadsheet. And you can filter through it, you can sort of find patterns and, and create your own categories and, uh, and really play with it for people who are very kind of data-heavy, right? And uh, a couple other examples for uh, how you can share results at the end when you, when you have a report. Uh, you know, um, what's really important is you wanna make sure you pile up evidence. So what happens with user research, a lot of times is, you know, you have these small studies maybe, if it's qualitative, you have 12 people that you're gonna talk to. And then you hear things like, hey, it's just 12 people you talk to. And you're, you're, how, how am I supposed to take this and trust that this is valid results, right? So if you work within an organization, you want to make sure you create a repository for all of the, the, the UX research projects that you have because patterns tend to kind of appear 
you know, again and again, the more research you, you do. And the uh, next time someone asks you, hey, it's only 12 people you talk to, you can say, well, and in this study, and in this study, and in this study, we're showing the same thing. So you better need to, to do something about it, right? It's, it's really hard to resist mounting evidence. And last, uh, my, uh, my last one is, you want to make sure you make uh, UX results visible. You want to be putting them in places, uh, you know, outside of um, just the, uh, the boardroom or the, your office, right? You want to be, uh, one example is uh, at PayPal, one of the companies we work with, they have um, in the cafeteria, actually, uh, a monitor streaming ses user research sessions all day, and you can watch them and, and get inspired, right? And also, my other uh, favorite example is uh, Genevieve Bell, who is an uh, anthropologist at Intel. And she, maybe you've heard this, uh, she has at her desk uh, a lot of artifacts from research that she brings from all over the world, uh, wherever she goes and, and does research, and uh, just kind of weird things. And, you know, people come up to her and they always ask, like, what is this from? And where did you get this? And it's just a great conversation starter for, well, we did this research, and guess what happened? And maybe you, you can do something about it, right? It's a kind of a cool way to, to showcase UX research. So uh, this, is, uh, this is all I have for you, and uh, we, can, we can open this up for questions. I want to ask, uh, you know, um, research sounds good uh, on theory as well, right? Uh, but when it comes to practicality, when it comes to business, a uh, lot of clients don't want to pay for it. Uh, either it's a you know, business decision or the time constraint for executing a project and delivering it. And this is the primary research, right? If I'm not wrong. Um, talking to users, getting the data, the insights, the references, uh, the inferences out of the data takes, I think, almost like three to four weeks, depending on the nature of the product and how the com complex the product is. Um, my question is then, um, how do we convince, first, if that's not possible, uh, if the client is a client, uh, we, and we have to worry about our paychecks as well. Um, uh, but then what is the other alternative, what is the other option, uh, in case this doesn't work? And I believe 80% of the time this doesn't work. So, just to make sure I understand, so you're asking what is another option if you can't, if do you don't have a research, budget? Yeah. Oh, oh no. Uh, so, for example, if the client says, I don't want to do this, right? Uh, I have some data I can share, you, I can share with you. Um, so, um, what is the other alternative research which is less uh, time consuming? Uh, and also uh, it doesn't cost too much money to the yeah, client. Yeah, great question. Thank you for asking. This is, a, so how many of you, um, I think there was a, one workshop was a design sprint workshop. Okay, so there is the same uh, thing for research. It's a, it's a research sprint, which is basically you, you can do in, um, in a week. And it was developed, I think, by, by the same, uh, by Google Ventures. Uh, and, and you can read about it uh, to, to see how to do it, but it's basically this much more condensed seven days, uh, probably f you talk to fewer users and cheaper and faster way. So that's one way. Uh, the, other, the other thing is, um, you know, sometimes uh, you don't have to do what we call primary research. You, you can do secondary research. So, you know, let's say you want to be designing a shopping cart, right? You can look up some uh, results from other research that was done on other shopping carts. And, you know, that's not a perfect solution because, like you mentioned earlier, it's like you don't want to be using someone else's research that might not be applicable to you, but, you know, it gets you kind of a starting point that then maybe you can get a budget and validate with real uh, sort of a longer project. Thank you very much. All right, second so question, question for me. Yeah. Hello. Uh, first of all, my compliments for what a great presentation. Thank uh, you. <laughs> like a child in a uh, sweet shop, just looking like, oh, so many sweet ideas. I want to try them out. Nice. Uh, 
But there was one thing that kind of tickled me. Uh, in one of your slides, uh, you said that it's a good idea to start with low-hanging fruit, things you know, that are easy to fix. And my experience shows that sometimes it might not be such a good idea, because if those little things are connected to the main usability issues, uh, then yeah, that's great. But sometimes you know, people want to fix easy things, while the big ones, the really important ones, are not fixed at all because they're too difficult. And I was wondering whether you've had the same experience sometimes with developers. They don't want to tackle things that might actually be important to users because they're difficult to fix. Yeah, that's a great question. Uh, yeah, so sometimes it's like you, you kind of do the, these easy fixes and then you're like, yep, we're done. The research, we, you know, we use the research and, and oh, forget the, the big things. Yeah, so my best answer to that, and I can think about uh, one or two projects where, where, uh, where this happened, and my best answer is, again, it's your responsibility as a UX researcher to to make make sure this happens. So, so one example is, you know, um, we work with this one company um, where it's really hard to get them to to um, uh, apply user research. So they do these things, and so they keep coming to us with <coughs> for new research projects. And you know, and sometimes we just uh, have to sit down and and tell them, you know what? Remember that study we did, did for you uh, two years ago, and we told you this and this and this. And what have you done about it? You know, uh, because you keep commissioning these new projects, but have you really implemented what what we told you before? And of course, using much nicer language for the client, right? But uh, again, my best answer is that you have to make sure you follow up and uh, see it through. Thank you. Any other questions? This part of audience, maybe? Agnieszka? <laughs> no? Uh, oh, thank okay, you very much so for a very I'll nice have a mic for you then, okay. Yeah. <laughs> uh, I have one uh, maybe practical oh, question. Yeah. Have you been ever asked to manipulate with the results? <laughs> What do you mean by Always. that? Always. Uh, like, uh, I don't know, I'm uh, a company, I want to sell it to the, to the client, but the research says that I shouldn't do that in this way. So maybe we can make it no five customers like it, but 50 customers like it. Uh, okay, give me, can you give me another example, just so I make sure I understand uh, the question? For example, I have uh, done website. And it's done, ready to sell. Uh, mm -hmm. But the research presented, uh, well, they are not for it. Uh, I, oh. I'm supposed to change a few things here and there. And as a developer company, a developing company, well, I don't want to do that, but I need to present the results to the uh, buyers. And they are not going together with my page. So. Okay, so so it sounds like what 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 happens is they already created something, and then you need to be presenting these results that are saying, "Hey, you guys shouldn't have done it this way," and then do you present that or do you kind do you not or how do you communicate it? Is that mm -hmm. what what? Okay, so see this comes back to all the way back to the the beginning uh, of this presentation when when people come to you and ask, hey, can you do this research for me? And it comes back to, you know, you want to be establishing at the very beginning what, um, what they need to, what they can change, what they cannot change, and what, what questions they want to answer. And so ideally, and you want to be also be, uh, like I mentioned before, um, making sure that people don't have this attitude of like, just show me everything is working right, because they're not going to be open to, to research. So ideally, you probably want to, at the beginning of the project, figure this out so that the situation doesn't happen. But if, you know, if, it, if it does happen, I tend to still present the, the results. And it's, it can be hard, and you have to kind of uh, be positive and frame it nicely, but um, I would still present it the way it is. Thanks for the presentation. And what are the top three favorite user research techniques and why? What are the top favorite? Uh, top three favorite user research techniques. Techniques? Yeah. 
You know, <laughs> wow, that's a, that can be a really long answer. Um, it, it's not really about techniques uh, t for me. So, you know, you can do an eye tracking study, you can do ethnographic r research. Exactly your favorite. My favorite, personally. Okay, my favorite are, uh, are questions I'm answering. So, you know, it's like what questions, what research questions I'm excited about, and then I decide on a specific technique. Uh, and I actually, I don't really have a favorite method. Um, it's more about what I'm curious about for questions that I'm answering. But anyway, yeah. it's a really good pickup line. <laughs> Hi, what's your favorite research method? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Thank you very much. Thank you.